Good morning. My name is Daniel Diermeyer. I'm the provost of the University of Chicago. Welcome to the second day of the fourth annual US China Forum. Uh, this year's forum brings together experts from a wide range of fields from across the world to discuss critical issues around China's role in the global economy. As we heard from President Zimmer yesterday, this is a particularly special time for the University of Chicago. In addition to the continued engagement of students, alumni, and faculty on issues related to China, here on campus later this month, we will launch our permanent campus in Hong Kong. Both our center in Beijing and our new campus in Hong Kong will work together to further our collaborative research across a range of disciplines, further deepening our understanding of and impact on the concerns of contemporary China. From a public policy perspective, the timing of this forum has also come at a unique time. It's a time when US-China tensions are high. There's a tremendous need and opportunity for us to improve our understanding of the other nation's respective challenges and perspectives. Like many of you, I'm eager to begin another day of discussions, but first want to take a moment to reflect on what we heard and learned yesterday. Michelle Caruso Cabrera, who joined us to moderate a number of panels, of, of panels as moderator extraordinaire, started off the forum by framing a list of questions regarding China's role in the global economy. Thank you, Michelle, for your thoughtful remarks. We also heard from two American business and thought leaders, Hank Paulson and Tom Pritzker, about the increasingly important role the business community is playing on key policy issues, such as trade, emissions reductions, sustainable development, all of which have a lasting global impact. Then we enjoyed a fascinating discussion on the geopolitical implications of China's Belt and Road Initiative, which, as you all know, is an ambitious effort to strengthen China's infrastructure, trade, and investment connections across 65 countries. We had three University of Chicago faculty, Ken Pomerantz from History, Austin Goldsby from uh, the Booth School, and Dali Young from Political Science, help us to frame the significance of the Belt and Road for global economic development and China's economic agenda. And then a panel that was particularly timely, Diplomacy in an Era of Trade Tensions, featured former U.S. Ambassador Baucus, former Chinese Ambassador Zhou, and so co-CEO of Kissinger Associates, Joss Ramo. Trade policy, of course, impacts more than our own economy. Trade pacts can help to shape countries' overarching long-term relationships, and we heard of how the delicate state of trade relationships between the United States and China has major implications on areas ranging from security to politics and geopolitical relationships. It was a pleasure to hear and learn from seasoned diplomats on this important issue. The day concluded with a forecast of China's economic outlook by a very thoughtful group of academic and policy experts moderated by former U.S. Treasury Secretary Bob Rubin. The panel highlighted a range of issues, including the global economic risks of an economic slowdown in China and a variety of other issues. This was a powerful day to end the first day of discussions. We are honored that these many esteemed panelists joined us here on campus to share their deep expertise. Their insights will inform the work of the many policymakers, faculty, students, and members of the business community who were able to join us yesterday. This morning, I look forward to switching gears a bit to learn from discussions about China's role in the global finance and trade networks, clean energy investments, the impact of Chinese investments around the world, and much more. I'd like to take this moment to recognize the Becker Friedman Institute for Economics, and especially Mike Greenstein and Eric Hurst, who are just sitting right there, for their tremendous work in putting together with their teams this informative and timely agenda. And I'd also like to thank the U Chicago Global team for their collaboration and support and great work in making this event possible. Together, they have made the U.S. China Forum an annual event for our students, faculty, and China area alumni and guests. 
I would also like to recognize the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation for its ongoing support of the University of Chicago's U.S.-China Forum. To begin today's event, it is now my honor to welcome Acting Consul General of the Chinese Consulate General in Chicago, Liu Jun. A career diplomat, Consul General Liu has been working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China for over 20 years and has been based here in Chicago for over four years. Thank you for joining us at the 2018 U.S.-China Forum and please join me in welcoming Liu Jun. Thank you very much, Provost Daniel, for, for your kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. It is indeed an honor for me to have an opportunity to welcome all the participants for the second day of the event. So first of all, on behalf of the Chinese Consulate General in Chicago, I would like to offer a big welcome to those speakers, to the audience uh, from all of the Chicago and out of the Illinois, a big welcome to the U of Chicago, welcome to the Midwest. Well, here I would like to thank the University of Chicago for hosting these two-day events, the U of China Forum 2018, featuring the role of China in the global economy. This is the fourth consecutive years. And uh, a big thank you to the leadership of this uni university for their strong, strong support. And also especially a big thank you to the U of Chicago global team led by Vice President Bella and also Mr. Michael Greenstone, the economic professor and director of the BFI of the university. And all uh, the team staffs, vo volunteers uh, for for your efforts in putting all this activity together. It's not an easy job. And also, I think it's fair to say that uh, this forum can't be more timely and more to the point. And also with much confidence, I want to say this forum's importance and significance grows with each passing years. Yesterday, I was very much impressed by those candy talks, discussions, comments, and the takeaway I got as I walked out of this room later yesterday. Uh, I have a, a few very strong impressions. First, it seemed to me that almost everyone agrees that China-US relationship cannot be more important and might even get more and more important in the future. So how to manage this close and complicated relation is a huge, huge challenge. So for sure, it will take tremendous efforts and wisdom from both countries. But one thing is for sure that I believe the blaming, accusation are not good diplomacy because they won't help solve the problem. And don't forget that the United States is the number one in the world. We are only the second. So if blaming works, we certainly have much more complaint than you do. So, so yesterday, lots of people talking about the suicidal trap. If we do allow this happen, I think everyone will suffer from a tragic repetition of history. So if we can manage this relation well between our two countries, or certainly not only our two countries will benefit, but also so does the rest of the world. So this is, there is a very high expectation from around the globe. So I believe by working together, we can make a huge impact. We can make a difference, huge impact. A huge impact comes along with a huge responsibility. 
And in China, we have a long history and civilization. So whenever we have issues, problems, we always try to learn from the ancient philosophy. So as, as Confucius once said, to think twice before you act, Another takeaway I got from yesterday's discussion is I believe there is still a big gap or deficit in terms of the understanding each other. Here in the United States, there has been growing suspicion on China's growth, development, and China is, has been accused of the unfair trade, uh, no level playing field, uh, false transfer of technology, poor IPR protections, and uh, South China Sea Vest and Road Initiative, and the list could go on and on. But part of the reason is that here in the United States, sometimes we don't, we cannot, we can only hear one side views and positions, and sometimes we don't have the access or we don't have the chance to have the other side's opinion. So again, you know, let me quote another ancient uh, idiom in China. So listen to both sides, you will be enlightened. Heed only one side, you will be benighted. So I believe in this regard, this forum offers us a very good opportunity to get a very close, a deep look at what this relation is all about. What are at stake between us? Sometimes the insights are often disguised and out of touch under noisy political rhetorics. So here, I would like to thank uh, those uh, few speakers from China. And a big thank you to the ambassador Zhou, the former US amb uh, Chinese ambassador to the United States, for coming all the way from Beijing and uh, elaborated on China's policy and positions. Here also, I would like to, to thank Professor Yi Ping Huang of the Beijing University. He uh, joined in a panel group uh, yesterday. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Wang Yanzhi, Executive Director and President of the Silk Road Fund. He's going to uh, join uh, a, a panel after this. So we're, we're, we are very much for looking forward to, those, uh, to their uh, views and comments from China. Last but not least, I, I'm confident and I'm optimistic that China-US relationship would eventually overcome difficulties, obstacles, and embrace a bright future. And I have a reason for this. First, a good relationship is in the interest of both countries and the rest of the world. So this fundamental reality has not changed, especially in this time in the 21st century. But how to achieve that? Here I would like to make another quote of the of Chinese idiom. There will be no making without a breaking. So as time goes on, this relationship uh, will need some adjustment, that's for sure. And also need more guidance. So, Luckily, yesterday, the two presidents, President Xi and President Trump, has talked over the phone with each, other, with each other on many important issues, including trade. So I believe sooner or later, relationship will reach the bottom and bounce back. I hope so. Second, well, the China is pretty happy with where we are now. And, uh, we have no intention to challenge the United States. And uh, even, even the strong is empty, you know, as described by the ambassador Ivo Dodd, the president of the Council on Global Affairs. He recently uh, he published a book called The, the, the Empty Strong. To be frank with you, China will not be interested in taking it over because we still have so much to do on domestic issues. Even some people, a s small group of people 
here in the U.S. may think and make China an enemy, but we won't fall into that trap. Third, I believe that future belongs to the younger generation. So does the China-U.S. relationship. And uh, looking forward, and especially today, we have a lot of the uh, young students are present at this forum. And uh, the forum offers many of op uh, very uh, uh, inspiring information and perspective you know, for them to learn and judge. And uh, also according to recent polls by the Council on, on Global Affairs and also Pew Research Center, the younger generation in the United States, especially between 18, from 18 to 29 years old, uh, they have much more positive view on China, probably thanks to the social media and high tech. So this is hope. So last but not least, let me conclude by making another quote from Abraham Lincoln. So this is the land of Lincoln. The better angels of our nature will eventually prevail. Thank you very much. So glad to see you all here, and thank you for those kind remarks. Um, and could I reemphasize um, how great it is that so many of uh, the panelists traveled from Beijing and from China uh, to join us, because we shouldn't be talking about each other or at each other, but we should be talking with each other, and that is certainly the goal of this U.S.-China Forum. Good morning, and welcome back to day two. Uh, this panel is China's role in global finance and trade growth. On the far end, Lars Peter Hansen is the David Rockefeller Distinguished Service Professor in Economics, University of Chicago. Also a, uh, a winner of the Nobel Prize, this very small club, even though here at the University of Chicago it tends to be big. Uh, Raghuram Rajan is the Catherine Dusak Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance, Booth School of Business, University of Chicago. Just flew in from talks at the IMF and former head of the Central Bank of India. Wang Yanzi is the Executive Director of the Board of Directors and President of the Silk Road Fund. And once again, in particular, thank you so much for traveling from Beijing. We really appreciate it that, that you've made the long trip here. So the topic is, as I talked about, China's role in global finance and trade growth. That's a broad topic. We're going to start a little bit more narrowly because of your specialty. I'd like to start with the guests from Beijing, first of all, to be polite and also to hear from you, but also because you have this great specialty. We talked so much yesterday about the Belt and Road Initiative, and you are in charge of the Silk Road Fund, which is about investments in the Belt and Road Initiative. Could you just tell us a little bit about the fund and how connected is it to the Chinese government? Um, the Silk Road Fund, uh, first, thank you very much. Great pleasure for me to come here. Uh, the Silk Road Fund was set up four years ago. Um, at that time, China launched its initiative, Belt and Road Initiative. Two important institutions were set up, the AIAB, which is quite well known. Another one is the Silk Road Fund. We, we kept ourselves the low key. We classify ourselves as a medium long-term equity investor. So we do direct overseas uh, investment. Um, the, the reason to set up a new financial institution, um, for the, thing, uh, the, the background for the thinking, there, there was already or there are already enough financial institutions why China is to set up a new one. The thinking is that the long-term medium long-term investors are not, not, not that so many, especially in China. There are a lot of financial institutions who do short-term investment. While the economies, especially those less developed economies, require a long-term fund for investment. So that's the theory uh, behind setting up this new uh, uh, fund. Uh, we have four investors. They are SOEs, um, so we are SOEs working independently. We work, we, the, the area for us to make investments are very broad. 
in the areas of power, resource related, infrastructure is very important and also uh, in areas of promoting economic connectivity. So we do a lot of investment uh, for the long term. That's the uniqueness uh, for us. We do investment based on the market terms. So yesterday there was a lot of talk about the uh, China's financing in the Belt and Road, uh, along this Belt and Road initiative, uh, even about the that chat came out for the, uh, that was really uh, 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 something new for me. But we work on the market teams. We work with partners uh, in other countries. So um, that's, that's what we are doing. I stop here right now. Yeah. So if, um, if you're just joining us today, <coughs> SOE is a state-owned enterprise. Um, so you've got four state-owned enterprises that are investing in you. How much, in, in, on CNBC I'd ask, what's your AUM? What's your assets under management? How much money are you investing, managing on behalf of these institutions? We have, when, the, when the company was set up, we have 40 billion US dollars capital. And uh, last year, there was an injunction of, in addition to this 40 billion US dollars, we have 100 billion RMB, which is local currency. So we have a two-tier. Uh, capital, uh, but the capital is on core basis, which means uh, we first have a project that are acceptable for, for us, then we will call our shareholders to put their money in. So okay. that's the size. By the way, I forgot to mention, if you have questions, there's going to be people walking around with cards. You can write them down. They'll bring them to the front row, and we'll be taking questions towards the end of the panel. Um, one final question to you before I move on to the other panelists. There'll be more, don't worry, but you <laughs> highlighted what was a lot of the discussion yesterday. Um, the criticisms coming out, debt trap diplomacy, economic imperialism. Um, I gather you would disagree, but tell me, what, what, do you, what would you say to folks? We spent a lot of time on the Sri Lankan port that got taken over uh, because the Sri Lanka couldn't pay the bills, and so therefore the, the collateralized asset was seized. Are we making too much of that? What? Well, I, I gave the example what we did in Pakistan. We have a hydropower project. Hydropower, uh, it was, we teamed up with China Three Gorges, who built the gorges. They have the capacity to do the, uh, the project. The and company. The, in company. Yep. company. Mm -hmm. And also with IFC, the World Bank affili Affiliates. We set up a company, and uh, we put our capital in, and uh, we start that project. We talk with the Pakistan uh, Electricity Authority, agreed to build this power, and the Pakistan uh, Electricity <coughs> Authority agreed to purchase once the project finished uh, at a given uh, level of tariff. So that is the project. We, we own, uh, uh, the Silk Road Fund is minority shareholder. And at right now, the Three Gorges is the biggest shareholder. But once the project's built in, after, say, 20 or less than 30 years, the project will be transferred to the uh, Pakistan uh, government or electricity authorities. So that's the way we work. And we put our own capital in. We have debt financing from banks. The banks will do this based on the c financial uh, consideration. Can we make, can we finish our project on time? Can we repay the debt? If we don't repay, we, our shareholders will put our money to return to the banks. Can the Pakistan uh, electricity authorities pay their tariffs on time? So this is sort of issues. We don't create a debt at the national level. We create that at the project, level, which we bear the authorities. There's no, I mean, yesterday they talked about that trap. I really don't know where this concept come out. In my project, there's no such things. Direct investment actually reduced the debt level of, of Pakistan. Yeah, so I, 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 th well, I think when people talk about debt trap diplomacy, there's this insinuation that for example, the loans were 
designed to be onerous, unpayable, and therefore China by design gets this asset. Um, and that was always their intention. And you're saying no, that I, always I, it's an economic... I really don't know if there is a financial institution, a bank, right. who work in that way, who live in that way. I mean, you shouldn't in theory, right? But in theory, in practice, yeah. I have never seen a, 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 fun, a bank live in that way or make a living in that way. I mean, that's... Uh, no, they would generally fail. If they, <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, Professor uh, Hansen, you travel to China frequently. Um, if we can move to the broader topic at hand about China's role when it comes to trade and global finance, your immediate observations to help us set the stage. Sure. <clears throat> well, a couple observations come to mind. Um, when, when I go to China, I'm often, often asked this question about when will the Chinese economy overtake the U.S. economy and the like, and it's, it's almost like a zero-sum mentality, and I find a very boring question. I'm much more interested boring. In, boring. I'm much more interested in questions about what are the mutual p economic gains between uh, uh, just potential out there between the two countries, and I find that a much more interesting conversation. There's a, there's two challenges there uh, that I find intriguing, and one is. The future of economic growth, I think, is true in the U.S. It's certainly true in China. It comes through nurturing new businesses, building new enterprises, uh, um, and, and promoting new ideas. Um, the uh, the uh, standalone banking sector has been notoriously poor at, 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 at identifying such and, and making such investments. It's, it's, it's made the so-called shadow banking activities all the more critical in China in order to try to nurture this new growth. You know, there, there's shadow banking challenges in the U.S. as well, but I think there's some special challenges coming out of China because of this. And, um, and, and given the, you know, the perceived need to regulate shadow banking, how do you regulate it in ways that you, also, you don't also squash the, uh, poten the potentially very productive investment? And so I, I find that a fascinating challenge going forward, and, 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 I, it's, and, and one that's interesting to see how it plays out. The other thing that really stands out is China's um, advances in so-called fintech, financial technologies. You know, we look at the, uh, at the payment systems which they put in place. Um, I think that this, this is in part a reaction to the sluggishness of the state-owned banking sector. They kind of jumped over the whole credit card system, and, and, and they've got this in, uh, incredibly impressive internet kind of exchange system in place. It's, it's, it's now leading to peer-to-peer -peer lending and the like. Um, those have been you know, fascinating evolutions and, and, and advances. Of course, anytime you see such advances, there's interesting questions that go along with them. There's now you know, concerns about how you regulate things like the peer-to-peer -peer lending in, in, in productive ways. There's issues about how do you produce, kind of assess creditworthiness. So um, big companies can do this on their own because they, they've got their own data sets which they can draw upon. But, uh, but to what extent do governments have to be involved in this? And, this raises fascinating questions about privacy. So part of credit evaluations now include things like assessing social networks. And it's kind of my observation of innovators is they're not always the most socially connected people. Um, I, I, <laughs> uh, and, and so I worry about there's being a technology out there that could be abused by bad governments in the U.S., in China, or in the future, uh, that, that's, a, that, that's a major invasion of privacy because of these internet advances. And, and, and I'm not sure how to wrestle with that one. I think that's a challenge in China. I think it's a challenge worldwide. Yeah, the big trade-off between efficiency and privacy and what it can lead to, we discuss it so much here in the United States as well. Professor Rajan, I, I, I interviewed Professor Rajan about a year ago, was it? At the, there was a different panel yeah. at the Booth School. And you, re, you thought the most important thing to bring up was what is the state of the Chinese economy uh, and what does it mean for the global economy? Do you want to elaborate? I mean, you think a lot about sure. this issue. Sure. Let, let me start first by agreeing uh, with Mr. Uh, Wang that I don't think these uh, situations where countries get into trouble because of the debt they've taken on is designed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think any Chinese lender would think that's the way to get influence and, uh, and win hearts and, uh, and so on. I think what is happening is there is the occasional mistake. Um, uh, projects that uh, essentially are not commercially viable, that have been financed, and it's happened since time immemorial, especially with large infrastructure projects. 
And so then we have to figure out how to restructure them, how to put them back on track. And you know, some of them are white elephants which will never see the light of day. I think the, uh, one of the concerns there is, is this, are the negotiations being done in a way that brings in more of the commercial aspect, especially from the countryside. And I think that's a learning process. As we go along, we'll figure out how to do more of it. Certainly the multilateral institutions, the World Bank, the, I, uh, the uh, IFC, etc., have had you know, 60, 70 years of experience trying to do this, and you know, there is still the occasional failure. So I think if, when China starts, and there are these, these issues, we shouldn't be uh, quick to rush to judgment, saying this is because of, you know, diploma, uh, of debt imperialism or something like that. At the same time, I think it would be really very good for both sides to have more transparency on the process of negotiation, etc., so that the immediate conclusion is not from the countryside, our guys sold out because there were lots of underhand transactions that were done, and from the rest of the world that this is China trying to sneak in through the debt door uh, to get a, a, a competitive advantage. So I, I think there's learning in this process that can take place. Um, I, I think China is, is undergoing a massive transformation, and you must have heard about that yesterday also uh, in a big way. And uh, as Lars pointed out, a big part of that is the financial sector. But I, I think it's, it's uh, important to understand why the dynamics are so, so different in, uh, in China. What uh, is happening, to my mind, is a, a transformation on the industrial side to far less dependence on subsidized inputs, on cheap credit, on cheap resources, etc. And on the household side, a movement to far less repression. Uh, one example for you is uh, household deposits in the banking system were historically compensated at very low rates. You're talking about financial repression. Financial repression. Re and this is a refer reference to oftentimes when <coughs> banks or governments keep interest rates low. It's a a absolutely, uh -huh. uh, absolutely. Um, they keep interest rates low so that they can provide cheap credit to industry. Industry gets cheap credit, utilizes it in investments, and it comes back to the household over time in the form of more jobs, uh, over time higher productivity, etc. But for a while the, ch the household is repressed with low interest rates. It's repressed in a way with lower than marginal product wages. This is the reserve army of people as they move from agriculture into uh, industry. Because there's so many of them you can afford to pay them lower wages. Now, over time, that's made up because as you grow faster, these wages go at a fast pace and people get rich very quickly. China has become very rich very quickly, but it has done that on the basis of what the West would call distorted prices. But it's been a very effective way. Now the prices are coming more back to normal. Now, as they come to normal, you have to change the method of allocation. The allocation can no longer be you know, centralized you build this, he builds that, we build these extremely long bridges because they need it, we build these railway lines because they need, need, they need it. You reach the point where you have to figure out whether it's needed or not. You're, because not everything is needed anymore. Infrastructure becomes much harder to build once you're more developed. What is the additional road you need to build and where? Mm -hmm. That's where China is now, I think, on, is certainly on the, on the building, which is why they're changing their model from an emphasis of investment-led growth to more consumption-led growth, to more market-led growth. And here is the big question for China. Can it allow the various markets to allocate resources in the, uh, the way that it needs now, th now that's reaching closer to the frontier? And, the, and the, the problem, to some extent, is that many Western countries have done this, but have done this without the additional constraint that China has, which is it wants the party in charge. And I think those two are, are something that we've never seen before. Having a dominant centralized sort of political structure with a, a, a market allocating resources. Economic freedom versus political freedom is another way that it's sometimes phrased. That, that's, that's, they, that's another way of, of putting it. And, and let, me, let me sort of throw up one reason. Uh, not, uh, markets go up and down. 
They sure do. And when they go down, it's because the market has figured out that it was getting it wrong, uh, and it's, uh, it's telling you that, you know, mm -hmm. rethink. Now, can a system which is more centralized allow that fluctuation? I, I throw this out as a question because, as you see, the last few days when the Chinese market was down, people were saying, when is the state going to intervene? When are they going to come in to bail us out? And to some extent, this is not far from an issue that has been raised time and again about centralized economies, uh, what Janos Kor and I call the soft budget constraint, that they are tempted to come in to bail out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in that case, can you allow the market full freedom? Because the market is always betting they will come in, right. and then it distorts decisions. So and that's and you have moral hazard, you basically. Have moral hazard, big time. Moral hazard is a concept in insurance where, when you insure something, people are more likely to do it because they know that they're going to get the insurance. Right? You can in actually engender more risky behavior because the person thinks, "Well, I'm insured for that, so why not go for it?" Right? If they're going to bail out the stock market. Why not invest in it? Is the is the general concept. So there's a lot to unpack there. There's some over there's some overlap between what uh, Professor Hansen said, talking about the um, financial system and the, the state-owned banks, and um, maybe not being so good at allocating capital. Um, Mr. Wang, do you want to weigh in on? I saw you nodding your head when Professor Hansen was talking about the shadow banking system and what was happening there. Did you have some observations um, that you wanted to add to that? Um. We had a private uh, chat before we came uh -huh. on this. <laughs> tell, us, tell us everything. <laughs> um, about the, the shadow banking, and it's much more related with, as Professor said, the efficiency of state-owned banks. Can they provide uh, efficient financing support to the people where they really need, or to the enterprises where they really need? If they work less efficiently, someone would take, show up. This is shadow banking who do. And uh, I think that's the forces of market economy, even working in China. If the state-owned company is not doing well, someone will show up. That's the shadow banking system to fill the need. Right. And also, uh, the regulators, regulators always uh, slow a step backward. When they realize this uh, issue, they come out. So when they try to bring the shadow banking within the framework of uh, supervision, it's very likely their way they will kill this shadow banking, make the more efficient work less or not longer working, or rely on those SOEs who do less efficient works. So this is an issue. That's why I, I talked to the professor. Uh, China is very interesting. This is really beyond what I'm doing now. You have a different institutional arrangement, but we embrace the theory of market economy, which is very new, how the system could work. Different system, but market economy. There's a lot of area that uh, certainly professor can do the research. You were here yesterday. Um, I, I would describe yesterday as a lot of people saying, China should be a market economy. Why isn't a market economy yet? We've been waiting for China to be a market economy. What is taking so long? <laughs> I, I, there were all layers of that. I mean, there was a lot of skepticism about Belt and Road yesterday, even from economists here who I would associate with the Democratic Party who are, believe in, to some degree, Keynesian spending, et cetera, but were s very skeptical about the level of spending on, on Belt and Road. I mean, I, a lot of the, the, the Chinese participants yesterday basically said, we're working on it. We're getting there. Be patient. <laughs> you want to add anything to that? Or are we, are we? Well, yesterday's dis discussion is really very high quality. Professor Huang from Beijing Un University has given a lot of uh, interesting points. China has overgone in the last 40 years tremendous changes. There are a lot of changes which I don't think the West really understand. The, the fundamental changes. But 40 years now, um, the U.S. is not happy. It's not going like, like us, like U.S., right? 
I'm not sure the U.S. really understands if China is really like U.S. It's the good thing or bad thing. I mean, that's, that's one issue. And this certainly brought a very legitimate concern, I mean, for uh, inside and outside people in China. Um, over the past 40 years, or over the last 20 years, China worked under the rule of WTO. China has benefited a lot from this globalization. Should China make some change? Because you, you're no longer in the past, so you should do some change. In which way? I mean, these are legitimate questions, even for people who are living in China. There's a much need for further reform in the SOE sector. I'm also pretty sure the role of government is also an issue if you want to move further with the system. Um, so, but the difficulties right now, really, over the 40 years of reform, a different player already established there uh, based on what we have, the interest. So you are touching more deep-rooted issues. Should government like to change its role? In which way it's changed? How SOE behave? Is there a market discipline to supervise their behave? Um, this is a lot of issues relating with China's institutional arrangement. We do overseas investment. We have to do based on the market <coughs> economy, or, or we have to behave in the market way because our partners are from different countries. They, they work in different ways. And it works very well with us. I mean, uh, throughout our last three years' uh, investment, we always team up with local partners, with international partners. And there's one phenomenon I, I don't think uh, people actually realize. We go in the Belt and Road together with the U.S. firms because my investment, a lot of services are provided by U.S. firms in the area of law, in the area of financial services, in the area of tax policies. So we work actually together. In the service sector, it's the U.S. firms that are working with us. We, we work together in the Boundary Road in this initiative. I, I meant to ask earlier if you could give us um, some sense of performance. Do you have any stats you can tell us or any insight you can give us based on the investments you've made so far, how they're doing? I mean, as we sit here and wonder about the, the ability of SOEs to actually perform well, you're running one. How's it going? We had, uh, over the last three years, total 27 transactions. Uh, two already exited, so existing 25. You've exited already? We exited two already. Mm -hmm. uh, we had investment in Russia, in Middle East, in Europe, in Southeast Asia. Pakistan is one of uh, the projects we mentioned. Uh, it has been, uh, I mean, better than we had expected, let me see. Thanks to God. I mean, you, you doing the direct investment, you sometimes you have to rely some, to some extent the element of luck. You have a good luck, you make a right time investment, so you, 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 you do well. But also... There's a saying in this country, I'd rather be lucky than good. <laughs> so. Also, I have to thank my team. They work very hard. Yeah, yeah. And also, I have to thank China's Belt and Road Initiative. It is well received you may disagree with me, in less developing countries. In developed countries, or developed economies, U.S. and EU area in general, it depends whom you ask. It is very well received. That's why we can do much better at this. But generally, you're, you're, the transactions are going well. They, they, I mean, have you had any defaults, or have you had to do any restructurings on any of them? N so far, no. I, okay. I cannot say in the future. But when you select the project, the financial consideration is the most important for us. We do the long-term investment. Can the project itself go through the cycle? There's up and down. Can you go through? There is uh, also the political risks. If the government changes, to mention that Sri Lanka is one of the case. If the government changes, 
is that project still relevant to society? So the project itself has to be fitting the need of the society where you go. So even the government change, the people still need that project. So that's a selection of the, of the project itself. Financially sound, sustainable, is critical to us. This has nothing to do with the ownership. SOE or private, you have to do that. I think this is the first important principle. And also, you have to choose the right partner. Mm -hmm. Local partner is important. The ownership, the project is theirs, not mine. I'm right. doing, I'm making You're the money, finance right? guy. Mm -hmm. And also, f for us, the success so far we have done, we try to work together with third party, together with the, uh, with the local partner. In this area, I think multilateral financial institutions and U.S. firms, actually we had the platform with GE, we do it together in the third countries. It's, it's great. I mean, that's why I, I say it depends whom you ask. Uh, I think that's the way. Yeah. Professor Rajan, I see you nodding your head. Well, I, I think the new institutions that China has set up, uh, AIIB, for example, uh, the new development bank in partnership with the BRICS countries, these are actually creating new ways of financing investment cutting through some of the bureaucracy that has developed in some of the old multilateral institutions. So I hear good things about the way they're evaluating projects, the way they're going into it. Uh, and I think it's high time we had some competition for the multilateral institutions from elsewhere, which weren't dominated by the same set of, uh, of countries and, and shareholders. That said, uh, I think in the longer run, it would be good to have some sort of a uh, global architecture uh, into which these uh, uh, new institutions sort of fit in. Uh, because there are places where competition can be bad and there are places where competition can be good. One example for, that the IMF has talked about is uh, when multiple agencies lend to the same country and nobody knows, uh, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, the country gets over indebted quickly not because of anybody's intent, but because we don't have a good sense of what the overall structure is. So there may be some advantage to trying to have an overall envelope, to have a platform for each country, which all these institutions sort of subscribe to, so that there is a sense of this is what's going into the country, this is how its development is being managed, especially for the least developed countries that have m modest capabilities at that level. So uh, I, I think it's very good news that China has set up these institutions. I think it's, um, it's financing that is very important, that has sort of uh, slowed down over the last few years, especially in the infrastructure area. But I think we need to figure out a way to sort of make it more, most effective. And uh, uh, I think thinking about that makes sense. Professor Hansen, anything you want to add to this? Yeah. <coughs> so observations in, in various different economies is that infrastructure investment always seems like a wonderful idea. Um, I was struck in the U.S. economy after, um, after we had our financial crisis in which we, uh, we wanted to rush out a bunch of fiscal spending. Sure. We were remarkably poorly set up in order to do infrastructure investments in smart ways. I, th I, th I think it's an important challenge to figure out what is a smart infrastructure investment. And it it's, it's kind of has this appeal to it. But are these, intel are, are these going to be projects that are in China's interest? Are they in the foreign country's interest? Um, how do we balance off the social value of them and the like? I think that's a very hard assessment to be making. And the more that that's done in a centralized way, the more concerned I'm, I am that you might have the um, less than successful outcomes out of them. But of course, you know, of course, I'm open to the idea of, you know, of China investing in the rest of the world in order to uh, make things better for, you know, for everybody concerned. But structuring the incentives, I think, is quite challenging. Everywhere in the world, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, it, down to the local municipality here, in yeah. Illinois even, right? Right. Um, <laughs> Professor Rajan, you highlighted um, whether or not there should be a water platform in terms of um, knowing what the left hand versus the right hand is doing. We're at this, China has grown so much uh, and its economy is now so big and because of its lending, we're now on the verge of something that hasn't happened in modern economic history, which is that we might end up with a, an IMF bailout, for example, that involves Chinese lending. 
Yep. Or there's going to be some kind of international debt restructuring that involves Chinese lending. It's the first time uh, we may see this. I've covered debt restructurings for a long time at CNBC, whether it was private sector, General Motors, the Greek thing that went on for, you know, ever. Um, and people are just, uh, they're not antagonistic about it. They're just very curious. Like, what's this going to be like, right. you know? Um, and part of any kind of debt restructuring is all the people who are owed money demand. They want to see, okay, what's the total debt out here? Because if we're going to restructure it, we need to know how much there is so we can come up with a better structure where all of us can get paid back at least some of what we lent, maybe not all of it, you know, we want to avoid the, um, the tuna boat situation down in right. Africa, for example. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it. Um, and um, what are you thinking about? I mean, how, how cognizant is well, this, are the multilateral institutions so, of the world? So our about system that? Is set up, uh, was set up immediately after the war, the Second World War. The U.S. was the most powerful country in the world. And it set up a system which was actually based on your growth is good for us. Mm -hmm. However, that system had a central place for the United States. It was a, set up, a system set up by the United States with extraordinary powers for the United States, which it did not exercise for the most part. So for example, in the IMF, it's the only country which has a veto, right? But it's got that and nobody objects because it's not used that often. It's respected. Everybody knows the U.S. can veto decisions. But they don't get there. And the U.S. rarely threatens to use it, right? Don't you think there's probably a lot of self-censorship on exactly. the part of there, the there other is, participants? There is some yeah. of that, mm -hmm. but it hasn't reached the point where people say, we don't like this hegemon, we want to overthrow the hegemon. However, in the IMF Articles of Association, there is a clause which says, the headquarters of the IMF will be in the country with the largest quota which happens to be the United States, which is why the headquarters of the IMF is in Washington. But by all parameters, China is becoming the largest country, right, soon. Uh, certainly within our lifetimes, whether it's in the next 10 years, we have to see. It's becoming more of a market economy with the financial sector increasing, etc., which means that by, by rights, quotas will have to adjust such that it becomes the single largest quota holder, all the rights that the U.S. has will transfer to China. Is that a reasonable thing to happen? Well, the structure of the system was set up post-World War II when we had a single hegemon. It's not a structure which is meant for a multipolar world where there are multiple players of similar size and uh, you know, economies are more broad-based. So we have to change the system in such a way we can accommodate this multipolar world. It has to become much more democratic, much less hegemonic as it was set up earlier. However, what we have right now is a resistance to change on the part of the old powers. And to some extent, I think uh, the new powers are setting up their own institutions rather than changing the existing institutions. As I said, this creates problems but we, because when you have to get together, to solve a problem, you have very different institutions that are not on the same page. Now, when we have a new great game being played out in Africa, everybody is trying to get an influence because this is the continent of the future. This creates problems uh, of indebtedness, etc. What do we do to solve this? I think we have to get together on the same page, and this requires change on all sides. Uh, I think from the old powers, they have to allow place for the new powers in a much more substantial way than in the past. How are we going to do this in an era of populist nationalism? I don't know. But it's, it's going to make it harder, but it has to be done. Otherwise, the old institutions will lose relevance. And we need coordination in this more integrated world in order to make the kinds of decisions which are more welfare maximizing in these countries. I, I take your point about the current administration, which I think is what you're talking about. Uh, in terms I think of more broadly than the, the, Europe is also <coughs> an issue. But. Sure, yeah, for sure. But I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure under President Obama they were going to be willing to give up For sure. IMF power. I, I think this, this exacerbates right? I mean, things a little bit, yeah. but the problems are historical. No existing power wants to give up any of it. Belgium doesn't want to give up its quota in the IMF, right? right. Uh, it's so out of whack with this Belgium size, but it doesn't want to give up its quota. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is a larger problem, but the, the reality is if we don't change, those institutions will steadily lose influence and new institutions will come up. Uh, Professor Hansen, what do you think are the prospects for China's future role in, in global finance and trade? Um, so China's already demonstrated an, an amazing ability to innovate in, in, in some important ways when it comes to, fin, to, to say, financial technology and the like. Part of this is adaptation to, to some of the weaknesses, uh, institutional weaknesses of the Chinese economy, but there's been major advances there. Um, I do, you know, we keep on talking about this transition to a market economy, and we had the discussion <clears throat> yesterday about do you do this fast or slow, and the China's decision has been to do it somewhat gradually, and, and, that, and, and, some, and, is, and is that good or bad? I worry very much that that process is going to plateau, and it's not going to, it's, it's, it's not, uh, the transition's not going to go all the way. We're, you know, we're now thinking what we see some of these financial challenges uh, facing China. We'll, we will go and reform the state-owned banks and, you know, get them to behave better um, and, and, and the like. And I, and, and I think external private sector competition is really critical here, and, and how that plays out I think is quite important in, in terms of China's future. Is it going to be really solved by just, you know, doing better monitoring of the existing state-owned system, or is it really going to open up even more for, uh, opportunities for, um, uh, for uh, private sector competition? And to me, that's a very important question. I'm, I don't have a crystal ball to predict how the politics and, uh, and are, are going to work out for that, but I think it's critical to China's future. It speaks to the tension that Professor Rajan was talking about <coughs> earlier about, I oversimplify, because I'm a journalist, uh, economic freedom, and is it ultimately good for democratic freedom? Um, you know, we had a guest on once who said, quoted 38 Special, which is a rock and roll band. And they have a very famous song. Hold on loosely, but don't get let go. If you cling too tightly, you lose control. Right, that there's this, that can you take the mental leap to say, the more dynamic this economy becomes, the more economic freedom that there is, do we actually retain more power as a result, right? I mean, am I close there to what the kind of tension that we're thinking about here? Uh, I, I, absolutely. I, I, w I want to echo what I heard, which was uh, with power comes responsibility. And I think the problem is being responsible for the market. If you are held responsible for the market, you tend to do a lot of stuff which is problematic. You have to have the ability to say, that's doing its own thing. I'm, do, I'm taking care of this side. That takes care of economic allocation, etc. If it penalizes you, if it dumps on your stock price, that's not my fault. But the more you sort of intervene and say, I'm in this private company, I'm here, I'm there, I'm managing the economy, the more you take responsibility for outcomes. And then you can't blame the market. So that's my, I mean, you, you said it perfectly with those, that verse. That's precisely the point. The more close you get, the more you get pulled up and down by the market, the more to show you're in control, you've got you to do this stuff to smooth it and then the market is no longer functioning as you would want it. And that's, the, that's, to my mind, the greater problem than, you know, you need political freedom to innovate and all that. I think maybe, maybe not, but I, I, I think really it's the separation between market and state, which is, becomes much harder when you have an infallible party which takes full responsibility for everything. Mr. Wang, I don't want to uh, ignore you, but I also don't want to push you into something that's outside the scope of what you came here to talk about. Um, and, and, and you want to weigh in here on this yeah. kind of weighty discussion? Yeah, yeah. From my own perspective, the future role of China in the global finance. I take the 
establish, establishment of AIAB as one example, something related to Professor Raja just said, the multilateral institutions. You have World Bank, you have a regional multilateral financial institution, AIA, ADB, uh, in different regions that you also have. But why the AIAB still has a room, still need, when the China decide to set up AIAB, it is welcome, at least in some certain countries. Because the current multilateral development institutions is no longer functioning in an efficient way or in some way as people wished. The rich country reluctant to give money to financial institutions, to multilateral institutions. They don't have enough money to, do, to support the poor countries. And also the multilateral financial institutions has become more complicated in whatever the criteria uh, set up by the major shareholders, which the less developed countries really cannot bear that criteria. So it's not qualified to get the loan. So that's the way the EIAB has a room. This is one way I think China played a role. And another aspect, as Chinese economy grow, Chinese enterprises uh, become, uh, bega has the wish to go international market as right now, because in the past, the enterprises, doesn't matter SOE or private, they feel already very crowded in China. So they have wish to go outside. When the enterprise go outside, the financial system will also help them to go outside. Uh, this trend will continue, sometimes faster, sometimes slow. So I think China's role in the future will grow in, the fun in global finance. The currency is managed. Um, we're right now wondering, we're going to see it seven to the dollar. Um, good idea, bad idea, talking about things that these multilateral institutions require, the IMF is, of course, always pushing, not originally, right? It was Milton Friedman who actually, when he wrote Currency Should Float, everybody thought it was a heretical idea. Uh, but now, of course, you know, the U.S. government wants to demand that China let its currency float. Wh what's your predictions about where that's going, and, and is it a good idea to maintain it right now? Their walled capital account, as we worried about whether or not there's stability there. Uh, I think the Chinese inclusion in the SDR basket uh, and the... The SDR basket is the IMF uh, the unit of money. Set of uh, reserve currencies that, that make up the IMF's unit. Uh, the SDR. Uh, I think uh, uh, China did a number of things in that process and now um, certainly uh, there is uh, far more flexibility to the renminbi. Uh, I think the fact that the renminbi has depreciated in the last few uh, months uh, should not be necessarily attributed to active intervention to depreciate it but rather is you know you apply trade sanctions on a country what happens? Uh, you know, the currency sort of adjust to that fact uh, to some extent. And, and so uh, I, I think it's much more uh, market driven than in, 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 in the past. I think going forward uh, uh, in China's goal of making uh, the renminbi more of a reserve currency, uh, uh, they are working uh, in, in fairly effective ways in trying to deepen their financial markets and allow the inflow and outflow of, uh, of foreign exchange, into the, uh, of, uh, of um, capital into their markets and out of the markets. Ultimately, having strong financial markets, strong trade, will allow more of the trade to be denominated in the renminbi and serve uh, to make the renminbi more of a reserve currency that's used. I think there's a well structured plan towards that. The, the, the sort of, uh, uh, I, th I think to some extent, the, the crucial part is uh, what, what Lars pointed out, uh, making the financial system more transparent and able to absorb and allow inflows and outflows of capital. And that's work in progress as the financial system is being cleaned up as the sovereign, uh, all, all these uh, wealth funds, etc., are, are, are being restructured. 
um, uh, at, the, um, at the various financial institutions. That's a process. But my sense is at the end of it, we will see a much more, uh, a much, uh, a red maybe which is much more used in international transactions. Professor Hanson, I saw you nodding your head a couple of times. Right? No, no? I'm fine. You're fine. <laughs> You're in path. Um, Professor Rajan, five minutes to Q&A, by the way. If you've got questions, fill out the cards. They'll be brought up here up front. In about five minutes, we're going to start taking questions from the audience. If the, if the currency were allowed to float, where do you think it'd be? It is, uh, to my mind, I mean, the, what they might control is the, the amount of daily movement. But to the extent we don't see a large uh, change in reserves uh, in either direction in a sustained way, it would suggest there's no target in mind. They're not moving it in a particular direction. Uh, I would say we've, uh, whatever has happened to the renminbi in the last you know, uh, few months, is perfectly natural. There is no sense, I mean. Uh, I, I guess just, would it, would it be beyond seven by now? I mean, would it be weaker? Would it be stronger? Would it be I, much weaker? I, I think most people think it's fairly weak at seven. Mm -hmm. But of course, if your biggest trading uh, partner is imposing a 25, uh, threatening to impose a 25% tariff on you, uh, you naturally weaken to offset some of the effects of the, of the tariff. So I don't think you need to, uh, there may be some management, but I don't think you need to point to very active management to explain why it is here. And I think, to some extent, the Chinese don't see the renminbi as a one-way street anymore. It used to be that the only way for the renminbi was appreciation. Yes. What happened in 15 and 16 was the possibility of depreciation, which is why they don't, and, and they intervene at that point not to to mm -hmm. prevent further depreciation, including imposing certain capital controls. So I don't think there is a sense anymore that it's a one-way street and that the Chinese are basically preventing it from getting stronger. I think they work both ways. Any of you have any strong opinion on the use of tariffs to try to affect change in Chinese behavior, considering what exports are to the Chinese economy, what trade is to the Chinese economy. Um, putting aside, which is the classic thinking about tariffs, which is they're generally bad, they raise prices, trade wars are not good. Um, what we know about the Chinese economy, are they useful to affect change? Or just in general, what do you think of the imposition of tariffs? Jump ball, as we say, in basketball. So, <laughs> I would like to see the U.S. lead by example instead of uh, and 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 work with a carrot instead of the stick. Of course, there are issues about <coughs> about in intellectual property rights and the like associated with China. That and what's the best way to address them? I'm quite concerned that if we go kind of product by product, country by country, try to work out, you know, um, start imposing tariffs. This can this could magically end in, end in a good place where everyone decides to remove them. It could leave us stalemated for a long time in a bad place and. I, I, I guess I'd prefer to see a different approach to this than, than, than the current one. But any ideas in terms of? Lead by example. <laughs> mm -hmm. Professor Rizan? Uh I was trying to avoid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, I, I mean, I, 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 I very much think that um, we are risking um, uh, a recovery which was, you know, uh, Reasonable, not great, but reasonable. Here in the U.S. Uh, across the world. Okay. Uh, I think you can. S the the problem with tariffs is the great uncertainty they create. Uh, because if you, they were permanent, you would know. Okay, let me invest in these places uh, to to substitute. But they're they're temporary, or at least you hope they're temporary, and then you don't know how long whether you move production or not. Uh, and that puts a dampener on investment, both in this country as well as elsewhere in the world. And one of the good things about this recovery was investment was finally picking up. So I think in the short term effects, it's been quite problematic. Now, uh, as we heard from the Consul General, maybe there's good news on the way that there is a discussion going on, maybe there is a resolution. 
of course we are six days before the mid uh, four days before the midterm election and i don't know whether how much to believe any news that i hear at this point because it's dri driven by political um calculations for getting I, out I the vote know. as opposed I, to i, I right. don't want to make an allegation i'm just saying i don't know how much to believe it right no 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 uh and and uh i think uh the um but but, but the longer term is is i, I think to Lars's point the example this sets for the rest of the world is perhaps the most detrimental problem. I see in India all those guys who have been advo advocating tariffs for the last 30 or 40 years coming out of the closet now and saying, see, the U.S. does it. You, you've been saying we should bring down tariffs, be a more open economy. You know, the, the guys that you were using as examples are now going the other way. And what, 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 what leg do you have to stand on? I have to say, look, I wasn't pleading the U.S.'s case. I was saying what made <coughs> most sense for us in India. But y you've basically undercut uh, a whole sort of uh, set of people who've been saying, uh, you know, see, the U.S. is so successful, follow them. But they don't, they don't understand the nuance of the we want reciprocity. The U.S. government says we want reciprocity. They've got very high tariffs. We have much lower tariffs. And they, you know, until they lower their tariffs, then we're going to raise our tariffs to meet. So, but, but this is the game these guys have been playing for so long, right? Mm -hmm. These guys have been saying, oh, we're a poor country. We need high tariffs to protect us because they've got so many advantages. Right. Uh, and plus, they, they really subsidize their farmers. Therefore, we need agricultural subsidies. We need tariffs. So uh, the, uh, all these contingent statements, uh, we need tariffs because of this, we need tariffs because of that, is what these guys have been saying for so many years. When the U.S. starts saying it, they've, uh, they've got a champion. Anything you want to say about tariffs? Um, I bet you don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> so my answer is so <laughs> obvious. But let me say this issue. So I'm, uh, the U.S. was not happy. I mean, using this tariff is... So two is good or bad, if you know all you, you, this great university, you know that. Um, one, re, uh, several uh, uh, claims. One is the surplus with China, trade surplus with China. Uh, I think China will run current account deficit very soon. It's only the issue that China with U.S. has some surplus. So the Chinese people, uh, policy makers, is, is confronting a different, uh, I mean, challenges for for them. Uh, so I, I, the second the U.S. claim, it's not second, third, but this is f forced transfer of technology, right? Uh, there was the issue talk a lot uh, y yesterday. I think the issue they miss first, if you force someone who against their willing, that's not right. But a lot of transfer of technology take place at a fair price. You, you, nobody asks that transfer at what cost, what price. We had investment, this is really my experience, involved transfer of technology. We had some investment in Europe. And the authorities in that country say one type of technology or other production you must promise continue in this country. You should not move that back to China. We agree because they have that advantage. They have the laboratory, they have staff, they have people, uh, scientists working, we want them to work. So we own that technology, but we want mm -hmm. keep that in Europe. But there's another type of technology they have, but they don't have market. So the they agree this technology can be transferred back to China and someone is going to buy that at the fair price that we agree. So this is really a market practice. Transfer of technology is a market practice. We have another experience, not in my company, but in my previous uh, career. Quite a number of Western companies make, uh, make investment not with cash, but with technology. Because that technology, they have more advanced one. They, someone, they can be transferred to third uh, developing countries instead of cash. 
So when people talk about this transfer, you claim unfair. You better think about what price that was. If someone doing or government doing some unfairly, that's a different issue you can talk. But in reality, transfer of technology is part of business. Questions from the audience. The capital control measures currently in place, are they a sustainable tool of the Chinese government and the People's Bank of China? I'm looking at you, Professor Rajan. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, Does everybody understand what this means? By, I'm sorry to interrupt you just as you're about to So there's a walled capital account in China, right? They have very strict rules about what money, how much money can leave the country, uh, et cetera. And it, it's not a, a free float of, of capital at this point. And there's lots of criticism that it should be. But then, of course, if there's ever a major crisis in China, people say, well, at least they have a walled off capital account. So that way it doesn't necessarily affect the rest of the world. Um, well, uh, first, there are ways that uh, capital flows out. Yes. And uh, you just have to see the amount of houses bought in Vancouver by Chinese citizens. 57th Street, New York yeah, City? Yeah, mm -hmm. to understand that capital is flowing out, there are ways around. And that's always been the issue with capital controls, how effective are they? I think they have, they're not, they're not ineffective. I think some of the controls that China put in place when its reserves were plummeting very fast, uh, were effective in, uh, in perhaps stabilizing, because they did many other things that uh, improved confidence in, uh, in, in the Chinese economy at that time. Uh, longer term, I think to the point of making re the renminbi a, a, a reserve currency and freely used, uh, I think free floating capital would be necessary. But I, I think the lessons we've learned over the years is first fix your financial markets slowly bring in more capital, let more capital out. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a process rather than a one-time big bang. And when you do that, eventually you reach the goal of, of full uh, openness. So I, I think the Chinese authorities are trying to figure out how to do it and uh, are managing that process. Uh, I, I think the direction is towards more capital openness, and I think they, uh, they're doing the right thing. Yeah, you only have to look at, at Turkey and Argentina to know that a, a country's got to have very, very strong controls internally, right? Or else they become subject to capital flight that becomes very, very painful, requires an IMF bailout. We have a, a question for you, Mr. Wang. Do the four investors, the SOEs in the Silk Road, fund expect a market return on their investments? Oh, we do. That's a pretty clear answer. We make investment, we want to return. Um, I think the difference for us uh, is, is we, stay, we can stay for longer time, longer period of time. But the return is very important for us. We, we normally, a minority shareholder, we have another partner. This return we set up together, so we share that return uh, it's, 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 it's market-based. Do, do you have a, a number in mind that you think about? I mean, depending on which part of Wall Street certain people, you know, work in, you'll hear some of them say, I don't get out of bed before a 30% return, you know? <laughs> you know, this is correct. The, the word has a lot of liquidity. Uh -huh. There's no shortage of liquidity. It's... The, the matter is that liquidity will not go to the infrastructure investment because low return, longer period. Right. Private money would not be happy with that longer 10 years. No, they only stay five years, uh, most uh, three years shorter would be better. So that, this is the gap. Of and, and that's why there's no private investors in this fund then? Yeah. 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 Because that was the second question from this. Professor Hansen. So am I allowed to criticize the question? Go ahead. <laughs> so, so it's my understanding that infrastructure investment is often justified by its uh, some type of social externality, and, and that's the reason why we want governments to do it instead of you know, the private sector to do it. And so maybe we should be looking beyond just the market return to the social return off of it, and, and maybe there's a wedge between the two. I think that's often the, the most compelling cases for uh, 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 for the government involvement in, in, in uh, infrastructure investment. Social externality being a social benefit, a social in benefit other words. that it isn't necessarily internalized by the market. Okay. Um, while we're on uh, Belt and Road, is it possible to make information about each Belt and Road project, the balance sheet, the uh, benefits, the shareholders, and the nature of the claims publicly available 
on a periodic basis. It would make it transparent and be useful information to all concerned. We, we have a website. Whenever we make, we finish a transaction, we make announcement. How detailed is a different story? Because financial data is a great by players. Uh, if you go to public, in, in, to what extent in detail? This is really a commercial uh, business. Uh, so uh, what we are doing, we are very transparent. Mm -hmm. Which country we go, what project we do. Uh, the information itself uh, is, is, is really commercial, so you mm -hmm. have to follow the practice. Now, I, gu I guess in the U.S. we would think, okay, a, a private equity investment, you're not going to get a lot of detail, that's a private transaction. Um, but the minute the U.S. taxpayer dollar is involved, everything becomes transparent, right? Um, so that's the, that's the way we bifurcate the world, but obviously your world is very different. We, we are not public company, but we have to report to our shareholders. But you have public detail. money, right? I mean, That's an right. SOE is... The shareholders yeah. take care of their money, so we have to report them mm -hmm. to them what we done, what is the financial situation of that project. So we do, but not in the way as a public company. If you're public listed, you have the rule, you have to go. Mm -hmm. spend, uh, in some of these transactions, it's also the other side, which is the, the public side. And so, uh, I mean, some of what is being asked for is from that side, what did you agree to? Yep. What were the concessions and, and how to make it public? So I, I think uh, making those public would reduce the temperature ar around these, uh, uh, these sort of transactions. And, and so people know that it's a broadly level playing field that we're, we're going into. And some of the concerns come from suspicions that this is not so well structured. And it would be nice to, to, to alleviate that by making the details. And, and I think it's equally the responsibility of the other side, but how to work these in such a way that, that it can be done. Sometimes the other side says, don't reveal. Well, that's right. when you have to figure out, you know, do you really want to get into that? Uh, last question, which should I have asked you, or did you expect me to ask you, or final thoughts? What's the biggest takeaway the audience should leave with from today? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think China's a fascinating economy with lots of potentially exciting opportunities. It, um, I think it's also attached to a fair bit of uncertainty going forward. So it's, it'll, be it'll be fascinating as an economist to watch it evolve. <laughs> Look, uh, I think we, we heard it again and again, and I think we should remember this. Uh, it's been 40 years uh, since China started on this, this really fascinating road. And, and we have to uh, sort of think about all the issues we're dealing with today in the context of it's just been 40 years. And therefore, a lot of structures will develop over time, a lot of changes will take place. Uh, hopefully all of them in the right direction. But sometimes we demand of, of uh, this country uh, what we would demand of countries that have 200 years to develop their structures. Uh, I mean, of course, China is a very old country. But in terms of this economic development and then the associated sort of development of other structures, it's been a very, very short time. Mr. Wang. Well, I would say, <laughs> probably you laugh at me. Belt and Road Initiative is a good initiative. Give them some time, let them work out. Thank you, Thank you for coming so far for this. And we really appreciate your participation and your frank responses. And also, of course, to our esteemed members of the panel from the University of Chicago as well. So thank you very much. This concludes our discussion. We'd like to extend a thanks to everybody joining us today. We're going to take a brief break. And we're going to see you back for our next conversation, Chinese Leadership in Global Clean Energy Investment, Green Finance, Sustainable Infrastructure Development. We're going to start promptly in 15 minutes.